Hello, everybody. It's good to see all of you here. Um, and I'm glad that we're able to do something together, even if we can't be at the building. So I was thinking about the song uh, this morning, Mary Had a Little Lamb. And pretty much everybody, if you're a kid, you know this song if you're an adult. Uh, but a lot of people don't know who wrote the song. It's a lady named Sarah Josepha Buell Hale. I don't know why she had four names, but she did. And we, uh, she was a very interesting lady. She did a lot of things around the time that our nation was just sort of starting uh, in the late 1700s. And one, of the, she was sort of an advocate for women doing more things at home and, and even at work and uh, got a lot of female authors published. But one of the big things she did, one of the most important things in terms of impacting our country, and this was over a very long lifespan that she tried to get this done, but she really wanted the United States to celebrate Thanksgiving as a national holiday uh, to the degree that she wrote to four different presidents. And finally, uh, after talking to Abraham Lincoln, uh, it, around the time the Civil War was sort of winding down, uh, she convinced him uh, through a letter to declare a, a national uh, celebration of Thanksgiving as a nation. And before that, they'd always had something done, but it was different in every state. And so she was often called the mother of Thanksgiving. And of course, Thanksgiving is an American holiday. And even though they had the stuff about the pilgrims and everything else that started in the 1600s, Really, uh, a lot of Thanksgiving was about biblical observance of thanking God for all that had been given to them as a nation. And there are a lot of things written about it. But when she got Thanksgiving to be this national holiday, it, it made me think about why they wanted to do Thanksgiving in the first place. And, and a lot of times things were very difficult. During the Civil War, it was, it was a terrible time. Uh, for both sides in terms of people dying and suffering and everything else. And I wanted to start with a question as a congregation, and that is, what are you most grateful for this morning? And I think it's a question that's important and it bears repeating uh, right now, because whenever we think about what we're most grateful for, it Im immediately makes us think about where our gratitude is comes from? Why are we thankful for this particular thing? And I think in 2020, it's a little different because it's harder to be thankful when things are not going well. It's harder to say, thank you, God, because usually when something good happens, that's when we say, God, thank you for this, whatever it might be. But whenever things are really hard, whenever we've had a year like we have in 2020, it's harder to say, God, thank you for today. Thank you for everything uh, in my life, because we're not thankful necessarily for uh, what's happening around us. Uh, we're, we're kind of struggling with what's happening, especially when something like this happens where we have to close church down again, and it, it's just hard. It's hard to say, God, thank you for everything happening right now. And whenever we think about gratitude, we think about the way that God puts gratitude in us. We think about why we're grateful, not just that we're grateful. That's what Thanksgiving is about. Why are we grateful? What are we grateful for? And so in Colossians 2, 6 through 7, and that's our theme scripture for this month, Paul is talking to the church in Colossae, and he's trying to help them to become more grateful and to learn gratitude. And so we're going to read again our, our memory verse for this month, and it is, as you therefore have received Christ, Colossians 2, 6 through 7, Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. And one of the things, if you look around in, in this passage of Scripture in Colossians, there's, there's something going on. There, there are people who are trying to pull the church in Colossae away from the things that they had originally believed in and done. And so he's trying to get them back on track. He's trying to remind them of the things that they're supposed to be doing. Uh, and so in doing so, 
he, he tells them, I want you to remember the things that you first received. I want you to remember why this stuff that you were doing from, from, the, from the beginning is so important. And so there's a couple of words here, a couple of things to really look at and, and really determine this is why we're thankful. Even in 2020, even when things are terrible and bad, this is why we're thankful. Because Thanksgiving isn't just something we do to, to be grateful to God. It's, not, it's a practice. It's something that God encourages throughout the Old and New Testament. And it's something you have to work at. And so I wanted to look at a couple of words today that sort of help us to be more grateful. A couple of phrases that he gives us here in uh, Colossians 2, 6 through 7. It's great to see, every, see everybody here this morning. I love seeing uh, Loretta Garrett because she can't always come to church, and it's great to have you with us. Uh, Kay, good to have you here. Kathy, um, Richard Clemens, uh, Catherine, great to see you because we can't really see you uh, at worship right now. Uh, um, Bonnie, Johnny, good to have you guys here. Good to have Eugene and all of you here with us today and everybody who's watching as well. And so a couple of words I want us to look at. The first one is walk. To, to walk just as we have received Christ. Now walk, when, whenever the New Testament usually uses this phrase, it means to live, to the way that we live, the way that we do things. We walk in the word and in thanksgiving by learning to live in response to what God has done through Christ. Now, our theme this year is to stay in the word. And one of the big reasons we stay in the word is to know how to walk, how to live. And one of the things he says here is, as you have received Christ, so walk in him. In other words, in the same manner that you first received him, you still need to be walking in that same manner. And he get and there's a couple of things to consider there when you talk about the gospel, to die with Christ, to be buried with Christ, to be raised with Christ. That process of transformation that we go through in Christ we walk in that manner. And because we walk in that manner, then God takes us and he transforms us through Jesus Christ. And so he's saying, as you received him, I want you to keep walking in that same manner, to continue to go back to that those original things that brought us to Jesus and continue in those things and to live in those things. And the thing is, we, we struggle with that sometimes to remember those, those basic things. And we get distracted by other things that kind of happen around us, especially in church. The most important thing about church, the most important thing when we come together, the most important thing for us to talk about, the most important thing for us to spend time studying is the gospel of Jesus. Because that's what brought us to God. Uh, that's what brought us to Christ. And so we need to stay in that particular place to stay in God's word as we first received it so that we can continue to be grateful for what not only for what God did when we were baptized, but for what God is still doing in your life. That the great thing about Christianity is God doesn't stop changing and transforming you when you're first baptized. He continues to change and transform you as you go along in life and as you're understanding of these first things that we receive grows deeper. And so when we thank someone, there's different levels of thanks. There's just, hey, thanks. You know, thank you. Great, great, you know, wonderful that you did this for me. Then there's thank you very much. And we're being more sincere with that. We're saying, thank you so much for this. This means a lot to me. But then there are times when we wanna thank someone and it, and it has to go beyond words, right? It's more than we can just say thank you for. We have to do something to be able to demonstrate our gratitude. It goes beyond simple words. It goes to action. That's the way that, that Paul is encouraging the church in Corinth to do. He says, as you have received him, therefore walk. Let your thanksgiving be something that translates into action here. It needs to change you. It needs to shape your life. And when we walk in Christ as a grateful response to what he's done, we need a daily reminder in order to be truly grateful. It's not just something we think about on occasion. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty thankful for that. It's something 
that we daily look at and consider. That's why we stay in the word, because as we consider what God has done and we continue to consider, to consider what God has done, he continues to help us to grow and to change. So Judges 2.10, they're talking about the generation that was raised under Joshua. And there were two generations that were impacted by Joshua, that second generation after the first one died, and then their children and the elders that came after them. And once Joshua had died, what it tells us is when all that generation had been gathered to their fathers, another generation arose after them who did not know the Lord nor the work which he had done for Israel. And it's at that point when they start worshiping Baal, immediately, once you have this generation that no longer stays in God's word as Joshua had done for two generations and kept them in the word, they immediately start going away from what God wants them to do. And, and we have to understand that gratitude keeps us centered on God. It keeps us living according to God. And when we go away from the word, our gratitude fades. To walk in gratitude, we need a, not only a continuous reminder, but a vigilant return to the fundamental things in Christ that makes us grateful. Do you ever think about why people keep a wedding album in their living room? I mean, everybody who was at the wedding remembers the wedding, but, but why do we keep it? Because once in a while, we like to, to show somebody those pictures, right? We, we like, or we like to remember ourselves, it's a reminder of why the things that we did when we were married was so important. We, we said our vows. We, we made commitments. We, we joined together, you know, when two people get married. And so we keep a remembrance of those things because once in a while we need a reminder. And the thing is, when we were joined with Christ, we're reminded of the fundamental changes that took place when we became Christians, of the promise of heaven, of the sanctification of our lives, of the forgiveness of sins, of all of these things. And so we need to continue to delve into these things daily so that our understanding of the fundamental things of Christ will not only make us more grateful, but they'll also continue to drive us forward as we look to what we're going to be doing as Christians in the years to come. So we, we walk in gratitude, right? But we also take root. He gives us this description back in our passage of Scripture. He says, rooted, verse 7 of Colossians 2, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as you have been taught. And, and this idea, three different words, rooted, built up, and established, or, or phrases, that, that he says, you need, you're already sort of built into this, so you need to continue to be rooted, built up, and established in the things you've been taught. And while first principles remind us of why we're grateful, it's in becoming rooted, built up, and established in the faith that we remain grateful. Because so many times someone does something good for us and we forget about that favor later on. We might be grateful for the moment, but we're not continually grateful in a way that we return again and again and say thank you. You only say thank you to, for, to someone so many times before you, you've said enough. But in Christ, we continue to be grateful because we continue to get rooted and established and built up in him. And in doing so, we become more and more grateful to God. And so our gratitude grows and changes. There's, there's two ideas in terms of making money that people often approach. One of those is to simply invest, sacrifice, do everything you can to make money. And that takes a lot of work. And then there's those people who are still holding out to win the lotto, you know, just to, to immediately get rich or do something that will turn a big profit right away. And the reason that they want to make money quickly is that they want a lot of money, they want a lot of wealth, but they don't want all the sacrifice and the hard work that comes from it. And, I, and people understand that, I'm sure. But it doesn't work that way most of the time. Most people aren't going to get rich quick, no matter how much they want to. And when you think about gratitude, we want to be grateful and show God right away, oh God, I'm thankful, I'm grateful, and then move on. 
But true gratitude takes hard work. It takes sacrifice. It takes effort. It takes continuous growth. It takes being rooted and established and built up in him. That's why we stay in the word, because in order to build true gratitude, it's not going to happen overnight. You're not going to win the lottery and suddenly be grateful. You have to work at it. And so gratitude is a lifelong pursuit. It's not simply something we do and then we're done. We must strengthen our gratitude in the promises and wisdom of God in order to stay rooted in him through the worst of trials. Because the times that we, we lose our gratitude is when circumstances change and things aren't as good as they used to be. And then we're like, well, why am I grateful? What am I being thankful for? I don't have much to be grateful for. And when we get in those situations, that's where we really need a reminder that we need to be stronger in our faith and stronger in understanding of the things of God. James 1, 2 through 4 reminds us of this. He says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But, he says, let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. What is patience doing in James chapter 1? It's building our understanding of why this is happening. It's helping us put into perspective the struggle and the trial we're facing so that in the end, we are grateful. Because when you're grateful, even for the hard and difficult things you go through, seeing that God is working even in those things, then not only do you get through those trials, but you learn through them and you're being equipped for something even worse or, or just to be able to be strong even in the midst of trials. And the thing is, what we find is that in staying in the Word, it teaches us how to be grateful, both in good and bad times and not according to circumstance. Because the default position is, I'm grateful if everything good is happening to me. When everything is bad is happening to me, I'm no longer grateful. But that's not the way the Christian person responds. We respond through good and bad with gratitude, no matter what it is. But that takes being rooted, grounded, and firmly established in the Word. It takes consistently growing in our faith so that our gratitude grows along with it. The two must be able to go together. So I have another question. I asked you at the beginning of this, what are you most grateful for right now? So here's another question. What are you least... Question. I just said question weird. <laughs> what are you least grateful for? Because I think that's another question. What are you least grateful for? Well, I'm least grateful for I got sick or a friend is sick. You know, I, All of us have kind of had hard times this year. I lost a a very good friend of mine, I mentioned that a few weeks ago, and, and I'm not grateful to lose him, but I am grateful that God helped his family through it, helped me through it, gave me perspective in all of it going on, and, and I think about all the things that I'm not grateful for, and I realize that I am grateful for God's presence in those things. I'm grateful that I have faith to get through those things. I'm grateful that there is hope beyond today, that even if someone is to perish, if they're in Christ, then they have hope that we'll see them again someday. And so as much as I, I'm ungrateful in some ways for things that happen, that I'm not just saying, oh God, thank you for this terrible thing. I have to stop and say, but Lord, I'm thankful that you are with me. I'm thankful that you give me the wisdom and understanding to get through these things during the hard times. So we walk, we take root, and we also abound. Now, this is an amazing thing to me. Back in our passage of Scripture, he says this. He says, Rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. And there he, he marries together the idea of study and growth and thanksgiving. That the two not only complement each other, but one creates the other. Thanksgiving comes from our living out and loving God's Word. It, it comes from truly embracing God's Word. Estella, good to have you here today, and Donna, uh, good to have you as well. I figure I should mention people since we're on Facebook Live. So 
whenever we think about abounding in thanksgiving, abounding in, in our teaching, that word means more than just you're doing really good. It means that is what we are abundant in, what is overflowing. That is what we have the most of. And when we think about staying in the word in an extraordinary manner, so that we are deeply grateful at all times, it changes our perspective of the things going on around us. So there are two things that we want to be overabundant in our lives. The first one is an overabundance of teaching, and then the second is an overabundance of thanksgiving. So if you want a good, solid, and, and fulfilling life, you want to have an overabundance of these two things, to be overly grateful and to have an abundant knowledge of God and his word. And that helps us to grow. The word Eucharist, have y'all heard that word before? It's kind of an alternate use of, of what we call the Lord's Supper or Communion. And it, and it means basically a, a thanksgiving of grace. Eucharista, we're, 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 we're giving thanks for grace. And, and sometimes it's, it's sort of boiled down to giving grace. You've heard that before, right? To give grace uh, or, or give thanks in, in, in a particular prayer. And when we think about the Lord's Supper, it is a thanksgiving of the grace given to us by Jesus Christ. That's where we get the idea of Eucharist from. But thanksgiving is being thankful for the grace given to us, for the great bounty of what God has done for us. And when we are truly giving thanks for all that God has done, we're remembering the most important things that we have in life, the things that, that we are most grateful for. And one of those, of course, is the gift of Jesus Christ. That's why we take the Lord's Supper, so that we can remember and give thanks for all that God has done for us. We choose then, as we abound in the word, to also abound in thanksgiving for all that God's doing, so that our thanks is fueled by heavenly wisdom and not by our current conditions. And so you have this very popular verse in Job chapter 1, verse 20. And I've, used a, I've heard a lot of people use Job for 2020. That's the year of Job, sort of, right? Mm -hmm. Where people are just struggling and suffering in so many ways. And this is after Job has heard that he lost his fortune. He lost his livelihood. He lost his uh, so many things that he had spent his whole life working for. And then the last one, he le learned that he lost his children. All of his children that he had prayed for daily that God would spare them and that, that, that he would pray for any sins they might have committed so that, that God would not punish them for any, any kind of, of wrongdoing. And this is his response when he had learned that everything was gone. It said, Then Job arose, Job chapter 1, verse 20, tore his robe and shaved his head, and he fell to the ground and worshipped. And he said, Naked I have come from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. What was he doing as he worshiped God? Blessed be the name of the Lord. What is that? It's a form of thanksgiving. He was thanking God, even though he had just lost everything. How was he able to do that? Well, the simple answer is that Job's thanksgiving had nothing to do with the circumstances of his life, but of his understanding of the nature of God and the goodness of God, that all things he had were because God had given to him, and if God chose to take those things away, he would not change his attitude towards God simply because God had taken something from him. When we stay in the word, we see the fruit of thanksgiving in our lives. Not for the passing circumstances in life, but for the growing knowledge of God's great and wonderful love and blessing he has poured out into our hearts for all time. And that's where we understand that our thanksgiving is primarily not focused on things that we see, things that can be taken from us. Instead, 
They are focused on the things that cannot be taken, the things that are spiritual in nature, the things that shape and change our future in heaven and in Christ, the things that they give us peace and hope within us, no matter what's going on. We're thankful because God has poured heaven out into our hearts and given us every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places because of his great love for us, so that we don't have to be tied to some difficult time or year or or moment in our lives and say, I can't say that I'm thankful right now. We can always be thankful because the things that God has given us are always there. And here's the truth. The time that we need Thanksgiving the most is not when things are good, but when things are at their worst. So if you could have an excess in something, what would it be? If you ask people, just general people in the world, if you could have something in excess, well, maybe some would want to be excessively wealthy, billionaire, zillionaire, whatever you call it, right? Some would want excess to be excessively healthy. I want to be have perfect health. I want to be able to do everything that I need to do and not, not get older and not slow down and just be able to continue to be healthy. Some might want to be excessively wise and have lots of understanding and knowledge. Some excessively successful in the things that they do and be able to have a business or an idea that, get, that, that takes off. Some might want to be excessively happy and for everything in their life to be perfect and for everything to go just the way that they want. But for me, I want to be excessively grateful. Amen. And here's why. Because if I'm excessively grateful, then I am the wealthiest, healthiest, wisest, most successful, and happiest person on earth. If I can learn to be grateful, then what matters the most, the spiritual health that I seek, the spiritual wealth that God offers, the spiritual wisdom from above, the spiritual success that we all seek in Christ, the spiritual happiness that cannot be taken from us, that will abound. And if we can find that, if we can truly be grateful in this world and in this life, if we can stay in the word and continue to grow in our gratitude and in our faith in the Lord, I promise you, no matter what hits you, you're going to be okay. Because you'll still be grateful. As Job, you can bow down and say, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away. But thanks be to God who is still with us who still loves us. My prayer is that we stay in the word and we learn to be more grateful so that whatever we have, whatever we've been given, we can still say, God, thank you for today. If I ask you again, what are you most grateful for? I would hope the answer would be, I'm grateful that Jesus saved me. I'm grateful that I'm going to heaven. I'm grateful that God truly loves me. If we can say those things, then we're going to be blessed in what we do. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we are so grateful for your everlasting love. We're grateful for the peace you give us in knowing Christ and in having all things given to us, both in heaven and earth, through your steadfast love and blessing. We pray that as grace abounds, so our thanksgiving might abound, that we might truly give thanks to the grace given to us in Jesus Christ, and we might live a life that demonstrates that which we first received in Jesus. Father, keep us from false promises. Keep us from false words that would convince us that we should not be grateful for Jesus or convince us to turn away from what God has given us to, to something else that's, that's of little value. Father, help us to focus on you, to be thankful, and to stay in the word so that we might maintain our gratitude and grow it until we see you again. Be with those who are sick. Be with those who are struggling. Uh, be with Loretta Garrett as she struggles with, with sickness and COVID and with others who have contracted it, with Bobby Bybee and others. And just help them to get better and to, to be healed. 
Father, watch over them and, and give them the strength and the purpose they need. And help us as a congregation to be thankful for you and to trust in you. We ask you all these things in your Holy Son's name I pray. Amen. So now we're going to go ahead and take the Lord's Supper. If you have it with you, if you don't, you can go ahead and pause this. And you can come back when you have the Lord's Supper to take. Or, or if you need to do that later, you can. Um, I thought about 1 Corinthians 11, 24 through 26, and I've heard this a lot uh, that's read over the years, uh, many years, about the Paul recounting what Jesus did on that last day, the, the night he was betrayed. But I wanted to focus on something maybe you, you haven't paid attention to before in the verse. In verse 24, it says this, And when he had given thanks... He broke it and said, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So the first part of that, it said, when he had given thanks. Now this was the Passover meal, but consider the action. The first thing he did is he gave thanks for the bread. And then he said what the bread was. And he was saying, I want you to be grateful for what you're about to receive. I'm giving you my body and I want you to give thanks for it. And that's, that's a powerful thing to consider, that he was telling the disciples, I'm about to give you my body, and I want you to remember this so that you might be thankful for it later on. And it's a beautiful thing for him to say. So as we take the bread, let's consider the value of Jesus giving thanks for what the disciples received then and what we receive today, his body broken for us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you saw it fit to send your son on behalf of us who were broken sinners, who could not by any stretch of the imagination make up for the sins that we did or to somehow pay a price that was too great for us to pay. Father, you paid with your son's body, broken for us. And as we take this bread that represents his body, help us to remember and give thanks for what Jesus gave when he allowed his body to be broken for on our behalf. We ask you all these things in your son's name we pray. Amen. He continues on in verse 25 when he says, In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often you drink it in remembrance of me. We, we get the remembrance part, but again, it says in the same manner. During the Passover, there would be a thanksgiving for the cup. And there were a couple of times they would drink the cup. It wasn't just once. But this was after the supper. And he said, okay, this is special. I want you to give thanks for what you're about to receive. And what, what they received was his blood. He says, this represents the blood of the new covenant made with me. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's remember that as we take it. Father, we're so grateful that Jesus shed his blood for our sins. We're grateful that he was willing to spill his blood so that our sins would be washed away. That we might have a new covenant with him and with you through his sacrifice, and that our sins washed away would be, instead, we would be made holy and righteous in, in, in your eyes and be able to stand before you. We thank you, Father, for this blood. We thank you for the covenant you made. May we honor it, and may we always be grateful for all that Jesus has done for us. We ask you all these things in your son's name we pray. Amen. I'm so thankful to have this time with you guys. Um, Jamie, it was good to have you uh, in between patients being able to watch this. Daryl, uh, thank you for coming on. And God bless all of you and keep you in good health. And for those of you who are sick out there, we're praying for you, for your recovery. We're praying for our congregation. We know that God is great and that he will do great things for us and help us through this time. So... 
We're thinking about you. We love you. Reach out if you need anything, and we'll do what we can to help and encourage you. And until next time, we'll see you. God bless you. We'll be praying for you. We love you. And until we meet again.